The rivers of the Yorkshire Dales normally give a name to that dale, and it's no different here on Nidderdale. The River Nid flows down it. It means bright shining water. We're starting at the top of the dale at Middlesmoor and travelling all the way down to Pateley Bridge, the market town for the area. Near Middlesmoor there are two reservoirs at the top which you can walk around and if you're looking for something a bit more exciting there's Housing Gorge and its water-based activities. Or something a bit more sedate, bird watching on Galfwaite Reservoir. And if industrial archaeology is your thing then there are the remnants of the old lead mines. Or if you're interested in art there's a spectacular sculpture overlooking the last working quarry in the area. It's all here and more on Nidderdale. Upper Nidderdale isn't quite in the Yorkshire Dales National Park, but since 1988 has been a designated area of outstanding natural beauty. It's easy access via the main road, the B6265, that runs between Harrogate and Grassington at Pateley Bridge. From this market town, it's 13 miles or 21 kilometres to the valley head of the River Nid. Valley Head ends with various no through roads. All traffic has to pass through Loft House, where we're starting. To the left is the village school. And where the Red Mini is coming down, that is the road from Massam. We'll be looking at there a little later on. Now note the brown tourist sign that points right to go to the reservoirs. Take the permissive road that belongs to Yorkshire Water. It's almost four miles or six and a half kilometres up to the reservoirs. The first buildings are of that of a volunteer fire station. The road is open all the time. Along here and even beyond the reservoir wall are farms and houses. The first part of the road was a track bed of a railway line that was used to carry building materials up for the construction of the two reservoirs at the top of the valley. The valley here is all limestone. The infant river nid is over in the trees to the right, where is a pothole, where the water has eroded along a weak fissure, and the water, when in flood, drops down to underground caverns and reappears further downstream. Here, the railway veers left through this blocked up tunnel on a lower gradient going through tunnels and cuttings, whereas the road starts to climb quite steeply in parts. The railway was constructed in 1904. It came up the valley from the main railway line at Pateley Bridge, and there were stations at Woff, Balthwaite and Loftus where the passenger service ended. Passengers were able to use the line until 1929, when the reservoirs were completed in 1936, it was dismantled. As we climb up the valley, we leave the limestone behind and enter millstone grit country. The reason why the reservoirs were constructed so high up, as the more solid rock can contain water. 1,200 people worked on the project over a 32-year period. They lived up here where a temporary village was built. 65 bungalows for managerial staff, whilst the labourers lived in 10 hostels accommodating 50 each. There was a school, a cinema and a small hospital. All the facilities included hot and cold water, inside toilets and electricity. They were much better than those who lived in the nearby villages. Up here you can see in the distance Great and Little Wernside on the watershed between Nidderdale and Wharfdale. The waters draining this side form the River Nid, although it can't be seen as it flows through both Angram and Scarhouse reservoirs. There are two reservoirs, although Angram is harder to see as it is in a bend at the top of the valley. They were built by Bradford Corporation and the water was carried over viaducts and through tunnels to Bradford 32 miles away. Water takes eight hours from here to get to Bradford. Scar House is the larger of the two, in fact it's double the size of Angram. 
The reservoirs are around 120 feet deep, or 36 metres. Scar House covers 173 acres, or 70 hectares, and holds 2,250 million gallons of water. The dam wall is 233 feet, or 71 metres high, and all built in the Scottish baronial style even though it's out of sight of Bradford itself, but the city fathers wanted to impress, even if only for themselves when it was opened. There's a four mile, six and a half kilometre path around Scar House, and in the car park are information boards, a toilet and a seasonal cafe. So, now let's turn round and go back to the main road. From here, we're going to turn right to Middlesmore. It's only about a mile away, or one and a half kilometres, but it's all uphill. The economy of Middlesmore largely serves the estate that managed the Grouse Moor just beyond, and only has around 40 permanent residents, and for the first time in over 100 years, its population is growing. There are also working farms here. There are about 30 in this part of the valley. The village sits on a platform that divides the Nid Valley at the right to that of a housing valley at the left. You first see the Methodist Chapel on the right. It was built in 1890. It became redundant in the 1980s and has now been converted into a house. To the right, where the house is being built, is the cobbled lane down to the church, St Chad's. The church dates from 1866. The parish up here is called Stonebeck Up, but today it's part of a parish of Kirby Malzard, which is to the north. The preaching cross could date back to the 7th century, as St Chad was the Bishop of Lichfield in Staffordshire, between 664 and 672, and is said to have preached here. It was found in the churchyard in the early 1900s. The view from the churchyard would have been very different just over 100 years ago. Galfwaite Reservoir opened in 1894. In the very background are wind turbines that were built in 2007 along the Harrogate to Skipton Road. This was a blacksmith's cottage and there is a stone trough nearby. The Crown opened as a hotel in 1818. Before that it stood just below and was called the King's Head and then the licence was transferred to here. The building attached to the right is the former post office. Further on on the right is the Middlesmore Institute, in fact two buildings built in 1869. The higher one was the village school and the lower one used for social events and night classes. The barn, just after that, is used by the gamekeepers during the grouse shooting season and more new houses are being built at the bottom of a track that leads to the moors. Let's return down the road and go see the geological feature of Halcyon Gorge. Halcyon, or Blayshaw Gill as it's sometimes known, is a tributary valley to the Nid, and in the Middle Ages the land was split between Byland Abbey, around 40 miles or 64 kilometres away to the east, and Fountains Abbey, 20 miles or 32 kilometres to the east. In fact, stone from here, a limestone called Blayshaw Marble, was used to build the abbey. This valley was created by a glacier that cut down through the millstone grit to the limestone base. Let Stan Beer, the owner of Halstein Gorge, take up the story with Jeff Drew. Well, I've walked down through the fields from Middlesmore to Halstein Gorge. Now, this is the point where the infant river Nid carves a spectacular ravine through the rock. I'm joined by the owner, Stan Beer. Now, when I first used to walk here many years ago, we always used to refer to this area, for obvious reasons, as Little Switzerland. But can you tell us exactly the geological origins of this place? Yeah. Well, the limestone was laid down 350 million years ago on the equator. On the equator? A long equator. way from here? A long way from here. And apparently it's moved at the speed of a growing fingernail. So if you don't cut your nails for 350 year, million years, you'll yeah. end up at the equator. Yeah. It's full of coral. Uh, you can see uh, crinoids and brachiopods fossils in the ground. You can pick up the uh, coral uh, fossils in the stream bed. Uh, the, the cave structure that was here, a lot of it was 
uh, dissolved before the Ice Age in, into tubes and uh, completely submerged uh, caves of water. And when the Ice Age came, it cut through the lower levels, levels of these and it let the water drain out. Right. And then it formed other cave systems lower down with the erosion. Uh, so we're getting the erosion, there's a lot of peat comes off the moors, that's acid against the uh, alkali uh, uh, limestone, and so it still continues to dissolve. So you could come here and obviously just to uh, marvel at the geology, but there are all sorts of practical things you can do here on a day out as well, aren't they? What, what can you do? Well, the, the geology and the uh, fauna are marvellous, but we also do activities uh, for uh, all age groups. The schools have come here for years uh, doing abseiling, gorge walking. We've thrown the door open to the general public and we do abseiling, gorge walking, via ferrata, caving, world's, world's the limit. So a full day, did a full week you could spend here yeah, probably? Yes, yes, we could do, certainly, definitely. Sanwell, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Well, this river, the Mid, it runs into the Ouse and the Ouse runs into the Humber Estuary and out to the North Sea. Now, let's return to Loft House. Like all the other villages along the valley, they started life as granges, sheep farms to be abbeys, and that's how it got its name, two-storey house. The golden age of Loft House was when the reservoirs were being built. There was a railway station here, so people could travel to and from Pateley Bridge, indeed catch a train to there and travel further afield. It meant that the pub, the Crown, not only served the construction workers, but also those visitors who could now come quickly and cheaply up the dale. Today, it's those locals, as well as those on nearby caravan and camping sites. There is also a memorial hall to those who died in World War I. At the top of the car park is the former rehearsal room of the Lofthouse and Middlesmore Silver Band that folded in 2017. And the former drinking fountain has also been remodelled into a war memorial. The road through the village, which can be gated at the far end, leads to Massam, about 10 miles or 16 kilometres away, and was only tarmacked in the 1950s. From Loft House, there's a two and a half mile or four kilometre gap before the next villages, Balfwaite and Ramsgill. The River Nid is on the right hand side. The river's 59 miles or 95 kilometres long and joins the River Ouse at Nun Moncton near York. After the dissolution of the abbeys by Henry VIII in 1539, he sold the lands off. Eventually it came into the hands of a York family in 1774, who held them until 1924. Just before the bridge over the Nid is a turn to the left that goes to the hamlet of Balfwaite, a Grange to Fountains Abbey. Although the metal road comes to a dead end, it continues as a drover's road, where wool and pack horses were taken over to Fountains Abbey. Unusually, one of the properties was a Methodist chapel and has now been converted into a house. Returning to the bottom of the road, we cross the Nid Bridge and are in Ramsgill, as its name suggests another sheep farm, this time belonging to Byland Abbey. The large village green has a fountain and animal water trough. The former York Arms looks across the green. Many people used to head here as it was an award-winning restaurant, including being Michelin starred under the chef Francis Atkins, but closed in 2020. 
The adjoining building was once the village school. Further around in the corner is Ramsgill Studio, the working studio of artist Sarah Garforth, who also sells traditional crafts. Also on the green is the War Memorial, and across the road is what looks like a chapel, but is in fact the parish rooms. The church is just around the corner on the road out. It's modern, that's to say it was built in 1842 and funded by the York family and is dedicated to St Mary. But if you go around the back, you can see the remains of a chapel built in the 12th century by the monks of Byland Abbey. Galfwick Reservoir is two miles long and at the Ramsgill end is a small car park and picnic spot. And if you cross the road, there is a viewing platform to watch the birds on the Ings. And was completed in 1901 as a compensation reservoir. Its job was to regulate the flow of water in the River Nid, because at that time, water was taken off by aqueduct to meet the needs of the city of Bradford. And all that, of course, before they built Scar House and Angren Reservoirs. Now, it was the woolen industry in Bradford which needed so much water. Sadly, today, there's not much of that industry left, apart from a few specialised textile products. The winding road hugs the edge of the reservoir, and just past the end, there is a turning left over a narrow packhorse bridge to the hamlet of Woff. Woff is an old Norse word for ford that runs alongside the bridge. The packhorse bridge was built in the 16th century, and had to be widened in the early 19th century as it wasn't wide enough for the farm carts. In order to avoid a long journey around, especially when the water was deep, they took the wheel off the cart and ran the axle along the parapet. Surprisingly, there is a pub here, the Sportsman's Arms. However, it originally was a house, Woff Grange, and converted into a pub in 1910. Immediately behind the pub is a former mill, Records reveal that there was a corn mill here around 1500. But in the 1770s, Nidderdale became a major centre of flax spinning, and this became a flax mill and was in operation until around 1840, when Knaresborough and Barnsley then became the centre of the industry in Yorkshire. It was rebuilt in 1880 and became a corn mill once again. Further along the road is this tiny Methodist chapel, squeezed onto the end of a row of cottages in 1859. It's on five walls of an equal length and is less than 25 square foot inside. This very narrow road continues ahead up the side of the valley to Paisley Bridge, but we're now going to return to the main valley road. We're now heading for Heathfield on Foster Beck and the lead mines that once dominated industry here since Roman times. Many visitors who come to Nidderdale do so to walk along its miles of paths, the most notable being the Nidderdale Way, a 53 mile or 85 kilometre long distance footpath that starts at Ripley just outside Harrogate, and comes up one side of a valley and goes down the other. The prosperous lead mine is on the Nidderdale Way and can also be reached by path from Pateley Bridge or Greenhowl Hill. The circular walks are about 6 miles or 10 kilometres. Or you can ask at one of the caravan sites here to leave your car by the end of a track leading to the mine. It's about a mile or one and a half kilometre walk on a track that is fairly flat. The Romans mined for Galena, the ore of lead in this area, as they used it for water pipes. Then in the medieval period, the abbeys did so too. They needed vast quantities of lead for their roofs. It was still in demand in the 18th century, still for roofing material, but also for ammunition. The lead industry in Yorkshire came to an end in the 1870s, 
but some minerals are being reclaimed from the spoil heaps since then. The Prosperous Mine is just one of several mines here, but the only one that has been conserved. Up there on the skyline, that's the village of Greenhow, near where we're going to finish this journey. Now we're heading to the principal town of Adale, Pateley Bridge. But just after returning to the main road, we're passing Foster Beck Mill and the Bridge Inn. This also was a flax mill that produced linen and was built in 1864. So much of the story of Nidderdale is about water. It's no surprise, therefore, to come across a splendidly preserved water wheel like this at the old Foster Beck Mill near Pateley Bridge. Now, this mill has had various manifestations. After it stopped being a mill, it became a pub, and now it's been turned into flats. But at one time, there were mills like this all over Yorkshire. They were situated next to streams which drained the water from the hills, which provided the power for the mills. And the licence was transferred to the former mill manager's house, and the mill converted into flats. Unusually, Pateley Bridge wasn't mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086, a book produced for William the Conqueror to let him know about almost every village in England and their assets. Pateley Bridge was first mentioned in the 12th century of Pathley Brig, the path bridge in the forest clearing. At this junction, we meet the Grassington to Skipton Road. It meets on the 18th century bridge over the River Nid two turnpike roads toll roads, one coming from Ripon in 1751 and the other from Nairsborough in 1756. Just over the bridge is where the railway line crossed. The railway came in 1862. It was paid for by the Metcalf family who owned the Glasshouses flax mill complex a little lower down and a brewery in the village itself. The line closed in 1964 and the goods yard is now a car park. There's a sculpture by Joseph Hayton on the former turntable, showing those who shaped the dale, a monk, a shepherd and a lead miner. The village is really one long street rising up the valley side. There are little side streets off it. On the left hand side, just beyond Weatherhead's Butchers, established in 1876, is King's Court, a courtyard of shops. The country ware shop Sipeland was once the King's Head the Crown Beyond was rebuilt in 1767 as an inn and post office and from where goods were carried. Then on the left is the Talbot Hotel, built in the late 18th century as a Star Inn, closed as a pub in 1983 and is now a tea room come bed and breakfast. Note the steps, these would help keep your feet dry from the dirt of cattle coming to and from the market. Then we come to the oldest sweet shop in the world and is validated so in the Guinness Book of World Records. Even though the sweet shop dates from 1827, the building is dated 1661. Hello. Hello. <laughs> now, I was mentioning humbugs just now. Do you have any? We do. We right. have the solid right through mint humbugs, the old fashioned with a chewy soffit uh, toffee centre, and then the mint humbug with a chewy Right, say no more. I've got to make a choice. Can I can have just a, a very little packet of the ones with the toffee centre, please. Toffee Golden humbugs, right. Listen, I just want you to know this is for me, it's not for the birds.
Lovely, thank you very much indeed. That's a pound, please. Oh, just a pound, oh, that's good. Perfect. Thank, thank you, you very much, much indeed. We'll be coming back down along the side street above it. The Pateley Club at Wright has a date zone 1664, later became the pub of Metcalfe's Brewery that adjoined it. Nearly 20th century it became the Conservative Club, which it still is. Then at the top at left is the Fox's Head Well. This actually stood on the Ripon Road further round, but was moved here in the 1970s. The canopy dates from 1852. Carries straight on up the street road called Old Church Lane. St Mary's was first mentioned in 1321 as a chantry chapel to Ripon Cathedral. It became disused as it was a steep 400 foot or 122 metre climb up here and St Cuthbert's was built in the town in 1826. The tower was added in 1691 and in 1724 the body of the church was reconstructed. It was continued to be used after 1826. Indeed, burials still take place up here in the new churchyard. Locals had a strong affinity to the church, hence it was never knocked down. Let's go back down and to the road above the oldest sweet shop called Church Street. What has been since 1968 the home of the Pateley Bridge Dramatic Society was originally a primitive Methodist chapel and built in 1859. The same year that the Oddfellows Hall next door was built. It was a friendly club. You paid money in to provide income in case of ill health or accident and could socialise here. Further on on the left is the former courthouse and original police station built in 1897. The court closed in 1995. And now at the junction, the road right is to Woff and up the steps is the church. This is St Cuthbert's, the church that was built in 1826 to replace St Mary's. The 15th century bell is presumed to have come from Fountains Abbey. The Latin inscription says, St Peter, pray for us. If we head straight across the road at the junction, we come to the former workhouse that was built in 1863 and in use until 1925. People who were poor, ill or old were sent here, even children. They had to undertake hard menial tasks in a very strict environment. It is now the Nidderdale Museum and opened in 1975. It has a large series of rooms that look at local life, crafts, industry and recreations of scenes in shops and workshops. Behind are a series of art workshops which are generally open to the public, including the studio of sculptor Joseph Hayton, alongside those of working artists including glass blowers, a ceramicist, jewellers and an art gallery. Now let's move down King Street. It runs parallel to the High Street. We have the police station on the left behind the old courthouse. Opposite is St Cuthbert's School that was built in 1875. Like Scarhouse Reservoir, it too is in the Scottish baronial style. In 1948 it became a high school, but when a high school was built in the village in 1981, it continues as a primary school. At the bottom ahead are flats that now stand on the former railway and the road to the right, Millfield Street, has a building called the Coco House. This was, in essence, a temperance hotel that opened in 1879 as a cafe where there was somewhere to socialise that wasn't selling alcohol. Also included a mechanics institute where night classes were held. The Coco Cafe didn't last long. In 1893 it became the Liberal Club and since 1966 has been a social club. Now, if we turn right, we're back over the bridge. Just over the bridge at left is the entrance to Bewley Park. The hall that stood there, the home of a York family, was demolished in 1925. 
The last agricultural show of the season is held at Pateley Bridge. It's the Nidderdale Show. It takes place in Bewley Park, as it has done since the very first show back in 1895. Indeed, the park was bought by the Society in 1925. Here you'll find some of our smaller animals, as well as those we all love, dogs, and probably the most goats you're ever likely to meet in one place. There are also attractions in the main ring. This year, it was Cossack riders who entertained the crowds. Once the show is over, it will be time to start planning all over again for next year and wondering what new challenges there will be to overcome. But it's the animals that we come to see, and they always have the last word. We pass the end of the road that leads up the dale. And if you take the left turn, as the road begins to rise, this takes you to Bewley, which was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. The road goes past the agricultural market and just through the village tucked away is Bewley Grange Chapel that was built in 1494 by Marmaduke Hubie, the abbot of Fountains Abbey from 1495 to 1526. It was a chapel for the monks that lived at the Grange that once stood behind the chapel. After the dissolution, the chapel was used as a house and from 1678 to 1831 was a school. In 1965 it was restored and returned to use as a chapel. On the exterior east wall is the Latin motto of Marmaduke Cuby. It translates as honour and glory to God alone. The road through Bewley is an alternative one we're going to follow later on. Climb steep up a gritstone outcrop called Guy's Cliff and on top is a rock feature called the Crocodile Rock not named after the Elton John song though. From here you can see a short walk away, York's Folly. In the late 18th century when trade was depressed, the York family employed workers for a shilling a day, 5p or approximately four pounds in today's money, to build a folly on top of Guy's Cliff. Originally it had three arches but one was hit by lightning in the late 19th century and collapsed. The road up here goes to hilltop villages lower down Nidderdale but we're heading on the steep road out of Pateley Bridge up Greenhow Hill, the road that leads to Grassington in the Dales, or to Otley on the outskirts of Leeds. It's three miles, five kilometres to the top, a climb of 1,380 feet, or 420 metres, to one of the highest villages in Yorkshire, Greenhow. We're almost here above a prosperous lead mine seen earlier. As the road flattens out, look for the signpost, the Coldstones Cut. There's a small car park opposite. Here, there's Toffgate Lime Kiln, only a few steps away from the car park. This was built in the 1860s when there was a huge demand for lime, not only as a fertiliser, but also for mortar during the construction boom in Victorian times, and was in use until the 1890s. Coal was brought up from the railway station at Pateley Bridge by steam-powered traction engines. What else could get up that hill at that time carrying such a quantity?
the coal was packed in the bottom of the kiln, then limestone chips from the nearby quarry put on top by a crane tipping it in. It burned at 800 degrees, and the lime powder, quicklime, collected at the bottom was dug out and loaded onto carts. Behind is a gate and a broad footpath that climbs the hillside. And looking up towards the summit there, you think, what on earth is that? It looks like a sort of, what, a series of stone circles. But in fact, it's a sculpture. It's called Cold Stone Cuts, and it's by the sculptor Andrew Seven. It was completed in the year 2010. I think we should go and have a closer look. When you get to the top, it's like, I don't know what really, perhaps an Egyptian or a Mayan temple. There's this sort of narrow ramp, and apparently when you get to the top, you can turn left or right, and then go on to a viewing platform. And the views really are spectacular over the whole of Nidderdale. One thing you don't expect when you get up here is this dramatic view of the last working quarry in Nidderdale. A splendid reminder of how so many people in these parts earn their livelihoods over so many years. The River Nid flows southwards from here, first above Harrogate and then enters a spectacular gorge at Knaresborough before flowing across the Vale of York to Nunmuncton, where it joins the River Ouse, about 10 miles from York. We're always adding new content to our site, so to be sure to be look out for adjacent areas such as the Visitor's Guide to Wharfdale. So, thank you for watching and hope to see you again soon.